is is the slide deck um, full screen? No, there's two slides. Ooh, so let me let me figure out. Keynote is fun. Um, does anybody know? Because I am a PowerPoint power user. Do we know how we can play this and not have the two slides? I think um, as a work around. You go to view slide only. Um, I wish I could tell you. Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to proceed. Let me know if this is really throwing you off. I will at least make it big enough so that um, yeah, the whole slides on there. Um, does this work well? Y'all can see. Okay. So um, I wanted to introduce myself again. Like um, Jonathan did a great job, but yeah, my name is Adrian. Um, for pronouns, I like she, her, hers, and I am a front-end software engineer who's been working about four years now. Um, I've been on back-end teams, full-stack teams, but front-end is my favorite, and I have a huge passion for all types of software testing. Um, so I was really thrilled to get this invitation to come talk to y'all tonight about testing and more specifically test-driven development and like let you know what it can do for you. I got to meet some of y'all when we were warming up before the call, um, but some of y'all I didn't hear from yet. So I'm wondering if in the chat, if you could share, number one, do you focus more on front end, back end or something else? And then number two, um, what's your experience level? And you could either put like the, the time um, that you've been coding or you could put like um, junior, senior and mid-level. Yeah, if we could drop that in the chat. Um, I'll take a minute and look at that. I know a lot of folks answered and they said front end. We got a lot of front end folks in the call and we have a lot of mid-level and junior, which is really exciting. Okay, nice. Okay. Oh, very cool. Someone has a testing background, testing focus. Very cool. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> um, there once was a woman and she was working on a story on her development machine until her tests would just not pass in one of those crushing scenes. Um, where was she to go? What could she do? It was really frustrating. <laughs> so um, she, she, found, she found this methodology and it had high test coverage, but the developer saw more it had style, it had flair, the test coverage was there, and that's how they became fans of TDD, or test-driven development. So what is that? It is a approach to development. It's not the only way, but it is a really great way. And it is evolutionary, it iterates on itself. It's a really great way to sequence your thoughts. It's a very logical way um, to build out any type of application. Um, it is test first development, and there's a lot of refactoring within the process. Um, something that I love is it audits your logic. It forces you to think through all of your requirements and your design before you ever write a line of code. This is helpful if you are pleasing like a development product owner, like you, a boss, somebody has hired you, they give you the requirements, or if you're in a situation where it's all you. Um, it helps you decide what the requirements should be. So a lot of you have probably heard about test-driven development. It's been a, in our industry a long time. What are some challenges that you might have heard or some things that kind of scare you from trying it out? And you, come on, you can come off mute for this. So I'll share one I hear a lot. People are really apprehensive about the time that it takes 
to do TDD and to build up these big, big test suites. Um, that's valid. It can be a challenge of TDD is figuring out the time. Um, we'll touch more on time when we get into benefits. Another one is a lack of knowledge. Um, it can be frustrating if you don't know what you're doing. Another one is when you're collaborating with other folks, um, either on a team or at a large company, it can be challenging to get the buy-in for it. And the reality is that when you work alone, of course you have autonomy, but when you don't, you really need that buy-in. Um, so if you're in a position where you don't have a lot of influence, it, it can be hard to get your team members on board, your tech lead. Um, and to be fair, that can be challenging. Another one is sometimes folks don't know what to test. So they feel like they don't have a map for it. It's just overwhelming. They don't know where to start, what to focus on and test. And then another one is they don't know the amount. They don't know when to, how much is too much and how much is too little. But besides all those challenges, um, test-driven development has a lot of benefits. So when we talked about time, um, a huge thing to consider is, does your team want to go fast or does your team want to go far? And the time that you spend up front writing unit tests can save you so much more time later um, because it can make your code reviews faster it can make it faster to um, debug and troubleshoot. And because you're not introducing a lot of bugs and defects into your code base, um, you know, you're not causing outages. That definitely saves you time from defects and rework. Um, but there's some other benefits. So I just mentioned it's great for collaboration. Um, it can really speed up your code reviews because it becomes a lot more readable what you're trying to do. Your test suites become a form of documentation. Because your tests are proving that the code says what it, it does, what you like say that it does, um, your code reviews can be sped up a little bit um, because you've got the testing. And then another case is paired programming. Has anybody done paired programming before with another software engineer? Yeah. Okay, so do you ever have this thing where it's a little bit hard to get into the groove because y'all are both thinking about different ways to approach the problem and you eventually work it out, but it's kind of like awkward at first. So test driven development can really help with that because um, it helps y'all look in the same direction and and work through it um, in a very logical sequential way. Um, so test driven development is also really great for ping pong style pair programming. Um, something you can do with a teammate is you can write a failing test and you can get, have your, um, your partner get it passing. And then they write a test for you and you get it passing and you can go back and forth that way. And it really gamifies the process. Okay, so another benefit is with test driven development, your code base does become easier to refactor or add functionality. Um, the reason why is really extensive test suites, they become a form of like regression testing, meaning that if you have a code base with some existing functionality, anything coming new into the code base, any code that you or another contributor adds, you'll know very quickly if it breaks anything else because those tests will catch that. Um, so that's, that's what we mean when we say regression testing. And it becomes easier to refactor because imagine that you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle. What do we look at? We look at the lid. Okay, the lid is the picture of like how it's supposed to look. So in a lot of ways, your test suites will become that lid for assembling a jigsaw puzzle. Meaning that we know that before we refactored, all the tests were passing. And now we're refactoring and you can make mistakes. We're human, it can get pretty complex. But once you're finished refactoring, the fact that all your tests are still passing, um, that's how you know you didn't break anything while refactoring um, because your, your assembled puzzle, <laughs> your refactored code, it matches that 
jigsaw puzzle lid, so to speak. Um, so another great benefit is that your code base is cleaner. Um, you are refactoring so often throughout TDD that you end up taking your code to a really elegant state. And another benefit is, as I, I kind of mentioned this one, um, less defects. And I don't know about you, but <laughs> that's one of the most frustrating parts of my job. Um, defects are so frustrating, whether you did it yourself, because you're like, ah, I should have thought of this. Or if it was a missed requirement, you feel frustrated that you didn't catch it sooner. Or maybe, um, maybe a teammate did it and you want to have blameless culture. You want to um, understand that, but, but it is still great when you have something like this in place for your team because you will see your defect count go down. Okay, so what are the steps for TDD? There are three steps and it is a cycle. So if some of y'all drive cars, you may notice that uh, this stoplight is out of order. <laughs> I edited the, the um, colors so that we could go in order to match the um, TDD order, um, but actual stoplights, the yellow and green light are switched. Anyway, the first step is red, the second step is green, and the third step is refactor. Red, green, refactor. Let's talk about each one. So in TDD, when we talk about the step of red, that means that we are writing a failing test. We want to see red text, red failures in our console. Um, in order to do this, you have to understand your requirements well enough to know what you're even testing for. So that's why writing this failing test is so critical. And your test must fail initially. I never trust a test that I haven't seen fail before. The reason why is in any uh, testing tool, any um, programming language that you're working with, it is possible to write a garbage unit test or any other kind of test where it's always passing. All you have to do is have the equivalent logic of like true equals true. That will always pass or false is always false. And, and it won't say that literally, but that's what your logic is resolving to. Um, so this is why it's so crucial that we make sure that in this first step, it is a failing test. Okay. After we have that, we move on to green. We make that failing test pass. So to do this, you write only the code that you need to make the test pass, um, not, not more. And this is really hard, um, not just for senior engineers, but for everyone, we we love programming. We we're good at solving problems, and a lot of things we can read, and we we quickly start abstracting the solution in our mind. Like to us, we visualize um, a very polished, finished product. But the goal is to not get there. The goal is to take really, really tiny baby steps to end up there. And the reason why is it's auditing your logic by forcing yourself to take really tiny baby steps and writing just enough to get it passing, um, you are not going to make a mistake in your logic and introduce a defect. Um, and something I mentioned before is when you have a test that is new, you need to make sure that all the existing tests are still passing. Um, so that's part of your built-in regression testing with the automated testing. Okay, and so red, green, our third step is refactor. So I recommend refactoring about every three tests or so. If you do it too soon, um, it's, it's not as optimized. And if you, if you wait until the end, um, you, might, you might have lost track of your thoughts of the logic. So refactoring, like in like little increments along the way, um, this works really well, but you'll find your own style with this. Um, so when we refactor, we clean up the code to make it simpler. So this is like, maybe if you have like a real nasty nest of like some nested like um, if statements, um, you can clean it up. Um, you might choose to rename things during this time. You might move things around. There's a lot of ways that you can refactor but it is safe to do it now because we, we have those tests and they're passing. 
and when we refactor, they stay passing. That's why refactoring is a better experience. So are there any questions over red, green refactor so far? Okay, so, oh, go ahead. So for those of us who maybe have little to no experience in testing, and you know, um, sure there's like a lot of information out there, but uh, it'd be, I think, helpful uh, someone with your background to give like maybe some nice starting points, like try putting this as like, you know, maybe one of your first or a couple of options for like, we could easily implement it into whatever projects we're just working on, like for ourselves. Yeah. Um, so I really like this question a lot. Um, I'm going to share some resources in our chat. Um, so the first couple links are high level what are these things? So it's like software testing, because maybe this is total, this is day one for you. You've never looked into it. The next one is extreme programming, which is where TDD comes from. And the third one is the Wikipedia page for test-driven development. Um, as far as getting started, um, I just put a favorite resource there at the bottom. It has it has some great things to look at. Um, I'm also realizing that for some of us, refactoring might be a new concept. So let me drop that as well. And we're gonna go over the theory more and towards the end, I'm definitely gonna let y'all know how you approach this, um, how to know which tool to start with and like how you can actually start practicing with this and in like a hands-on way. Okay, so um, we talked about red, green refactor. So that is a cycle. Um, and this cycle is going on back and forth all throughout development. So you would start with an empty file and by the time you have finished building your source code, like you've built, you've like finished your file or added the functionality, you will not have to go back and backfill your tests. Um, your, your unit tests will have been built along the way. So this cycle is going on back and forth. And there's another type of testing, which is called end-to-end -end testing um, or integration testing. Um, this is sometimes a requirement depending on where you may work at or just the things that um, you care about in your application. So this wraps around. So end-to-end um, -end testing is what it sounds like. It is a test for being able to make it from the beginning to the end in your flow. And it can be something like, like a happy path test of I, I have multiple pages in my flow, um, I'm starting at the beginning, I'm navigating through, and anything that's supposed to happen on those pages, you're testing that it happens the way that it's supposed to. Um, so if you write your end-to-end -end test first, it's going to be failing. And this one is actually going to stay failing for a while. So it'll usually be failing until you drive out the needed functionality to make it pass. And just for your awareness, like, that would usually be um, several unit tests. But um, once you have the functionality there that the end-to-end -end test is passing, that's when you know it's time to write a brand new failing end-to-end -end test. So um, I know that some folks may be new to end-to-end -end testing. Let me share that as well. If you are not sure about where to start, you're like, I don't know if I should start with unit testing or end-to-end. -end. Um, the answer is think about think about what you want to do. So if you if you're at work, like they're going to tell you. <laughs> if you are just practicing um, or like it's it, you're building a personal project, um, then you you have the choice. Um, and so there's some different philosophies about that. Um, there is something called a testing trophy, which is a metaphor from someone in our industry, Kent C. Dodds. He talks about the testing trophy. So his philosophy is to write, write tests, not too many, and to focus on your end-to-end -end and integration. So if you were gonna go down that route, um, you would pick up end-to-end -end testing as a skill set first, and you could go and add your unit testing later. Um, so let me share something for that.
And so before I go to the next slide, um, did you feel like that answered your question, Mark? That was Mark who asked, right? Yes, that was helpful. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna share the testing trophy. Okay, so this is in the Zoom chat, okay. And then um, really, if you're like, I'm just not sure, still, even after looking into that, flip a coin. <laughs> Either one is great. Um, the, the difficulty of testing is pretty equal. Um, you, so I think you would do well going either way on this forked road. Okay, so our next thing is once you finish this, like you have you have 100% um, test coverage for your unit tests and you have a lot of um, your end-to-end -end tests um, that you feel match all your requirements. How do you know if you're done? And how do you have like full ultimate confidence that you've tested what you need to? There are a couple of things that can help you. So the first one is complement your TDD approach with additional types of testing. Um, testing is something that we layer. And so unit testing plus in it in testing will give you a lot more confidence about um, releasing or sending out to production than just one type alone. Um, you also would introduce types of non-functional testing. Um, so that could be things like performance, security, and accessibility testing. These are things to give you total, total confidence. Um, but if you're just focusing on unit testing for now, there is something I want to introduce to y'all. It is in zombies. So zombies is an acronym um, that folks came up with to guide them through the test driven development process. It just helps you remember very specific cases that we care about. So let me open this for you and then we can take a look. And the null case was not originally in it. So that's why we've added the um, in before zombies. So it's in zombies. And so there's like a video on it I'm gonna put this in the chat for y'all to deep dive into later, but in zombies is a way to feel good about what you've decided to test. Um, this is what it stands for, zero, one, many, or sometimes more complex, are boundary behaviors, um, the interface definition, um, exceptional behavior, and the S is for simple scenarios, simple solutions. So let me put some stuff in here for you about in zombies. Um, in zombies is not super popular. Um, so you might have not heard about it in the industry, but this is something that I recommend a lot to beginners or just anyone who's not sure what order to maybe try out the TDD. So I've got it and I'm adding to the chat. Okay. So another way that we can be really, really confident about our um, TDD, like it's bulletproof, it's airtight, <laughs> is there's an additional type of testing that is out of scope for today, but I'm gonna tell you what it is. So you'll leave with the definition and you'll have situational awareness that it's a thing. There's a type of testing called mutation testing. It tests your tests. It assesses the quality of your unit tests. It's not a new type of testing that you write. It's not a new language or tool that um, you're writing. What it is, is it's, it's a tool that um, it, it's introducing like fault based, it's seeding faults into your existing code base and it's checking if you have covered all possible cases. So this, this is a really powerful tool to um, number one, find edge cases. And number two, prevent the scenario that we mentioned earlier, which is sometimes you accidentally <laughs> write a garbage test where it's not testing the thing that you think it is. It's, it's testing something um, that's not dynamic or the wrong piece of code. Um, this will catch that. So this is mutation testing. And for front-end developers, Striker is the leading tool right now for JavaScript um, mutation testing. If we have any Java folks in the chat, then um, PI test is a leading tool. 
And if you if you have another language besides those two, you could drop it in the chat and I could tell you um, what tool would be a good one to look into. Um, but this is also something where you can do a web search. So you can say like your favorite language, mutation testing, and the, the SEO on this tends to be pretty good. So whatever's popping up, it's probably like the leading tool right now. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, in a metaphor of like, first we crawl, then we walk, then we run. When you really get good at testing your application, um, this is you running. Mutation testing is, a, is like an amazing way to have that ultimate confidence. Okay. So um, just to illustrate where it's fitting in, you would complete all of your end-to-end -end and unit testing first. And after that final end-to-end -end test cycle is closed, it's passing, um, you think the story is done, that's when you run mutation testing. And if you have less than 100%, that means that there are gaps in your unit tests. So you would just go back and write more unit tests. Okay. Um, so TDD tips and tricks. Um, these are some resources that I have picked out for y'all. These first couple ones we went over already. Um, the anatomy of a test. Okay, so this can be for a unit test or an integration test. This is another acronym to remember the four parts of a test. Um, and every test you, you want to have an assertion. The assertion is the actual line of your code that will either pass or fail. So the assertion is going to resolve to a, like being it's being true, it's passing, or it's not. Um, that means you're failing. But before you can make an assertion um, within your unit test or in the end test, you need to usually do some type of setup to say what's actually being tested in your application. And then exercise, this is normally where you would like call a function or um, create the behavior that you're going to make the assertion on. So the final thing in this acronym, S-E-A-T, the T is for teardown. Teardown is a type of cleanup. Sometimes, depending on the way that you set up your test, you don't want it to apply for all of your tests. You just want it to apply to either a few or just one. And teardown is optional. You don't always need it. But the times that you do need it, if you forget to, um, like, take care of and clean up that setup, you will have the following thing happen. You will have random failing tests in your test suite. And um, one, of, one of the um, code smells or test smells for this is that it's confusing because if you run the test by itself, it passes, but then when you run them all together, like things are failing. Um, also, like if you move them around in order, and then a different one starts failing, you're like, okay, this is a teardown issue. Um, my setup is cascading down. And so um, that's what you should know about teardown. So I'm gonna drop this into the chat. And Sherry, I really appreciate your comments. This is really helpful. And Rob, yes, mutation testing is awesome. Like, Oh, I could filibuster on that. That might be something that we come that would that could be its own talk, to be fair. <laughs> um, so as far as TDD, you search for just that TDD and whatever your favorite language is that you're working on. Um, also, if you already have a favorite testing tool, you could search for just like TDD and Jest or TDD and JUnit. And there's a lot of great um, materials and resources out there. So I also have these testing resources. Um, here's the testing trophy that we already talked about a little bit. Um, let me do, do. Um, So these are some good ones. So it's definitely sharing these. And I also have some examples. Okay, so I want to talk about a simple example and then more complex. Okay. So you probably noticed that we didn't look at any code tonight. Um, that's because th tonight we were talking about the theory and we wanted to have a high level understanding of what are the steps, what does the cycle look like and get you started on how you can like pick out 
what testing tool you're going to use and how you'll get started. But if you are a front end developer, um, this is about a one hour video of myself and um, I went on a show with Ben Myers. What, what we did is we did test driven development. We did a really simple example. We did like FizzBuzz, which is a really popular um, programming exercise, especially like in interviews. But the thing that is cool is um, we did it with uh, JavaScript and we were using just testing. So I'm going to share this for y'all. If you're like interested and you're like, you know, I really think I want to try it. I really, really recommend this. Um, and like I said, it's an hour, but you can you can follow along. Um, like if you want to pull up your own um, IDE and do it, it's a simple example. And then you can pause it like if you want to see. Okay, so this would be a simple example. But some folks in the call tonight, they are working on code that is um, a lot more complicated <laughs> than FizzBuzz. It is complex. Um, an example would be legacy code. Does anyone tonight know what legacy code is? Yes, Jonathan said it. It's old code. Um, Sometimes legacy code is only five years old, and that's really sad, but it's true. Um, a, lot, a lot of times, uh, legacy code is 10 years, 15 years, sometimes decades old. Yes, our industry is built on legacy code. If you go to a large enterprise that's not a startup, they probably have legacy code. So legacy code is really mysterious. It's really nebulous. It's hard to tell what's going on. A lot of the folks that wrote it have left the company. They're not around to ask questions. And the documentation for it may be really, really lacking. And because it's so old and so many hands have been in the code, it can really become a Frankenstein of like just bolt on logic. So people think it's impossible to use TDD with that, but it's actually not. So if you are in a situation where you work with legacy code, you, you really should look at these awesome resources. Um, Something that I mentioned before is that TDD gives us confidence when refactoring. Um, if you need to refactor something that's old or something that's really big, TDD is your friend. So, so even if you weren't testing along the way, if you can get some end-to-end -end tests or some unit tests in place, that is better than nothing. So like in our puzzle, our puzzle metaphor, Ideally, you want the whole the whole lid of the puzzle so you can see the whole picture. But if you at least had a picture of it, <laughs> um, that's going to provide more confidence than nothing at all. Um, so that's an interesting strategy um, where you can leverage TDD. Um, and something really interesting is this. So Sandy Metz gave this talk um, a while back. Um, I think she did it in Ruby. But this code makes no sense. So in this video, it's like magic <laughs> because she uses TDD um, to refactor something that is like it's it's very weird, like mysterious code. So I'll share that as well. Yes, dropping in the chat. So I already shared the legacy ones, and then um, oh, I think I accidentally sent it as a direct message. Let me send it to everyone. Okay, so here's the legacy code examples, and here I'm doing um, Sandy Metz. And Jonathan, do we have a way to, like, can I share my slides with y'all later? Do y'all share slides yeah. usually? Well, I'll put it, I'll have it on YouTube, but I, I if you want to share them, you can share them to me, and I'll, I'll have a, like, Google Drive link that I can use to share. Okay, perfect, okay. Um, so, I'm seeing your time, you know, at 7.55. I'd like to use what time we have left to take any questions. What would y'all like to know? Right now, how prominent is TDD inside the actual industry? Yeah, um, this is hard to tell um, because I don't know of any place that is tracking that metric. Um, I, and I don't see this question asked a lot in like those surveys, like, you know, how there's those surveys about like state of CSS or state of JavaScript. I don't see this asked a lot. So I'm not totally sure, 
But even within my one company, like I'll tell you that it ranges a lot. There are teams that do very little testing. There's teams that do a lot of testing, but not through TDD. And then we have teams that like 100% of the time are doing test-driven development. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts on that? I think, I think also like the prevalence of it is, it's hard to measure what code bases were or were not um, created this way. Um, I, I've never seen it like trend on Twitter, but like it's on Twitter, for example, and we can see the we can see the love for it when we do a web search for it. There, there are a lot of tutorials on it. So, I mean, it has a presence, but I'm not sure how to quantify that. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I will say that recruiters know about this. It's, it's at least that well known. This is something that if you put on your resume, um, you'll usually get a smile. And sometimes you get a question like, oh, tell me more about that. So it can be something worth pursuing. Any other questions? Andrew asked a question in the chat. Who's normally responsible for unit tests on a team? Ooh, good question. Um, it depends. <laughs> it depends on where you're working. Um, but I would say that from what I've seen, unit tests are usually written by the engineer that's delivering the same code. Um, it's not common to have all the tests delivered by an engineer and have a um, quality engineer or quality assurance. So I hear QE, QA, they would not usually write your unit tests. They usually do um, a lot of manual testing and then they run a lot of other automated testing, um, but they're not writing your unit test suites. And somebody in the call had a testing background. Would you have anything to add to that? And so I, I think that it is best for the person who's writing the source code to write the matching unit test because you were closest to that work. You understand the logic best. Um, it's possible for somebody else to write the test for you, but I, I think it works best if, you, if the person who writes the code writes the corresponding test. And yes, we're definitely going to share all these links um, whenever we're on YouTube and or Meetup website. Yeah. Does someone else have any questions tonight? Also, if you have any comments. Um, so somebody wrote um, D Thompson Dev. TDD is used in a lot of places and picking up some traction. Yes. Um, Ooh, and then Clint was saying earlier, cross your fingers that your stack stays supported. Um, do you mean like your the testing tool within your stack? Is that what you meant, Clint? Mm, you might be on mute, um, but Quick that's question, fair. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, so I read your comment about cross your fingers that your stack stays supported. Um, when, do you mean by that, like that the testing tool is staying supported? Or what did you mean by your tech stack? We were talking about legacy code and how like what time frame, I guess. So I was just like, if you're if you can stay on a stack that kind of gets support like long term that you can kind of like do incremental upgrades over time, then you're kind of like hoping that you don't turn your code into legacy code in a way. Awesome. OK, yeah. Um, that makes sense, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, there's some. There's an interesting thing to be aware of um, for those that are like, y'all want like industry awareness. Um, React testing library is something that is gaining a lot of traction right now because um, the latest version of React will no longer be supporting Enzyme at some point. Um, so it's really interesting how things like that can happen. And, and that's across software engineering, like tools and languages, lots of them have their rise and their fall. And so as technologists, we have to stay committed to a life, um, yeah, lifelong learning. <laughs> it never goes away. You'll never be 
a total master where you're caught up, there's nothing new to learn. Um, but like, if you're lucky, your tech stack will stay around for a while, at least. <laughs> that can be great. Yeah. And just see any other messages? Um, yeah, and so somebody asked about major challenges when performing. Um, I kind of mentioned them earlier, um, but I can kind of restate them. The first one is it folks feel like it takes a lot of time, but the time that you take writing tests can be made up for time and time again with the potential to save time later. So yes, it can add half a day or a day to your story that you're developing. That's fair. It takes time to write it. But if you compare that to shipping code that hasn't been unit tested and having a defect that needs to be reworked or realizing you missed requirements or even causing like an outage, um, that's a lot more time later. And having like all the tests, um, it makes the code more readable, easier to maintain, and it speeds up time in code review. Um, and then another challenge is people sometimes don't know what to test. So things that can help with that are, um, we mentioned earlier the in zombies acronym. And I know that that link is higher up in the chat. And another big challenge with test driven development is um, have you'll have cover you'll have like unit test coverage. It can be at 100%, but you still might have mistakes in your tests. So the ways that we can check our work are having peers do code review. That's why we have other engineers look at our work. Um, and then you can you can complement it with another type of test. Um, we mentioned end to end tonight. And then um, if it's unit testing, a great way to check your work is you can run mutation testing. Um, and so that kind of solves that challenge there. Um, so that is a way that you can feel confident in your TDD. Yeah, thank you for asking. And I don't see any other questions. Um, I know we're a little bit past eight. Um, anything else before we kind of end tonight? I'll uh, I'll probably I'll have a few things to say after after you're done with the presentation. But it was it was really good. Um, I think. Thank you. I appreciate that praise. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. There was another question, by the way, where, let's see, where might you recommend learning more about React testing with Jest? Yeah, um, so for anything you're trying to learn, you can do like the web search, right? For um, the tool that you wanna use, so Jest and then like TDD. Um, and then I shared something higher up in the chat let me find it and I'll share that again. So actually, um, if you wanna see examples, the YouTube that I linked where it's writing tests first with Adrian Mallet and I was on the semantic show with Ben Myers, um, that would be a great resource for you. That's a little under an hour, but in that we're doing fizz buzz and we're using just. So I think that's, a really good tutorial that you can either just watch or you can follow along with it. That'd be a great one for just specifically. Um, back to Jonathan. <laughs> cool. All right, I'm posting these um, these links again that I posted earlier. So again, it's our YouTube link, our Discord link, our next meetup, our next hangout. Check out all the links, click the stuff, um, join the things all the things. Um, thank you, Adrian, for a great talk tonight. That was awesome. Um, so usually what we do after the uh, after the talk is we just kind of open it up if anybody has questions or if they just want to like hang out and chat or ask general questions about development. I know there's people who are like just now getting into the field or just now like, I don't know, maybe I want to learn how to code. I don't know. Um, so this is a good time to ask those questions. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we have somebody who could like who could answer, whether it's Adrian or, or somebody else with, with experience who'd want to answer. It's kind of just imagine that we just got done face to face and everybody's just kind of hanging out, right? That's kind of what it is. So 